welcome to another episode of The Savvy Entrepreneur. I'm Talos Alamatian, your host. How do you like my new at-home set? It's not quite the same as in studio, but I really like the relaxed feel of working from home. Today we'll be discussing commodities. Commodities are something that can be interchanged with something that's basically the same. So a pound of flour can be exchanged for a pound of flour. A bushel of wheat can be exchanged for a bushel of wheat. Or in this case, a barrel of oil can be exchanged for a barrel of oil. Let's explore why options are even a thing. Perhaps you're an oil producer in Texas and you're making $70 a barrel on 1,000 barrels a day production. Now let's say this is because there's a conflict in the Middle East. But you have a premonition that that conflict is going to stop. When that conflict expires, the oil price is going to drop down to, let's say, $30. Now, let's say that your price to produce the oil is $40 a barrel. So that $30 price would mean that you're losing $10 a barrel. In this scenario, you may want to make a futures contract that would guarantee you somewhere above 40 but perhaps less than the 70. This is the purpose of these types of contracts. Let's say you're a chemical company or a refinery and you need that oil to produce your product. Now let's say you also think that that war is going to expand so that $70 per barrel price is actually a very good deal when you think about the potential price increasing to over 100. In that scenario, that company would love to buy that oil producer's oil at, let's say, $60 a barrel. It's all about hedging your risk. For the producer, they want to make sure that they're making more than what it costs them to produce the oil. And if you're the consumer of the oil, you want to make sure that the prices that you're purchasing the oil for is not going to wreck your margins because your finished product is probably not going to be able to change its price. Now, let's say some speculator bought that contract. They may hold on to it for a while, then they may sell it to someone else. But once you have that contract, that contract is then a living thing that can be exchanged on different markets. Let's say, for example, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, where most of this type of trading originated. It also occurs on markets all across the world, including markets like the S&P 500. Today we'll be discussing the recent price fluctuations of oil. It recently went negative. Producers were actually paying people to take their oil, which is fascinating for a commodity that is so valuable. To help us understand this, we'll be having discussion with my lifelong family friend and mentor and advisor, Jeff Arsenich. Jeff has done many things in his illustrious career, from being a professor at the University of Calgary to running multiple oil companies as CEO. Having exited over half a billion dollars, he understands entrepreneurship. And I can't think of a better person to help us understand the commodity industry. Jeff, I obviously know a lot about you because we've known each other my entire life. But could you tell the audience about your background in the oil and energy industry? Yeah, my history goes back to uh, 1975 when I was uh, a land negotiator dealing with farmers um, for an oil pipeline being built in uh, Western Canada. Um, so that was my introduction. I found it into industry fascinating, so I ended up uh, getting involved full time, uh, first in land and then in economics and business development, uh, and then. Uh, Finally, got the motivation to start my first oil company in 1993, and uh, I thought I was going to build the next Exxon, but I, I found out, made a lot of mistakes, but it all, all ended up fine. It's a good learning experience. We uh, ended up making money for everyone, selling the company four years later, and then um, proceeded to start three more oil companies. All did well, different rates of return. But, uh, we learned about how to make money in the oil business. And the fundamental of that is a real intimate understanding of oil prices and what drives them. And uh, we took advantage of that knowledge to 
buy low, sell high as part of our strategy, as well as reducing costs and improving productions. But uh, understanding where oil prices uh, went is key. And since then, I've diversified to other startups in renewable energy and technology. But uh, once an entrepreneur, never you never stop. Absolutely. I, once you're bitten by the bug, you just uh, are not satisfied with anything else, right? <laughs> and you know that as well as anyone. <laughs> so with your wealth of knowledge of the industry, can you talk about how the industry has changed since you first got in, into the oil energy industry? Yeah, it, it has fundamentally changed. <clears throat> I think the biggest change is that Junior companies have trouble starting up in today's environment. When I first got involved in the oil business, there were thousands of junior oil companies, as small as one or two employees, and there was room for juniors to, to have their niche, in spite of uh, you know, the market being dominated by uh, what used to be called the Seven Sisters, the seven biggest oil companies. Uh, but now, um, it's a big company game. Uh, Shale is dominating the landscape for uh, new investment until recently. Uh, I think there's going to be a collapse in that, but it, it's very little room now for small startups to uh, get gain a foothold in today's industry. That's interesting. So when you're talking about lots of smaller players, are they all um, occupying the same market or are they in different niches within the market? Bit of both, uh, because the oil industry uh, is, was driven by finding oil. Anyone who had a good idea on how to do that had room to compete. Because uh, I think Jay Paul Getty first said it: uh, "Oil is first found in the mind of men." So good ideas were all oil companies started, including the majors. Uh, you go back to John D. Rockefeller was the fa father of five of those seven sisters, um, he had a great idea. His idea was, well, instead of just taking crude oil and using the naphtha and throwing away the rest, let's uh, refine it. And use a new technology to do that. Uh, it was new at the time. And because of that, he was able to be the lowest cost producer. And he basically just showed his books to his competitors refineries and they just gladly sold out to them because they, they could never compete against them. And it, uh, yeah, all 90% of the industry are from that good idea. Yeah, and he was rewarded by a antitrust uh, suit which broke him up, correct? Well, uh, yeah, although there's mixed things about that. Uh, it sounded bad for him, but then the day after he was, his standard oil trust was broken into 25 different companies, and they all started trading on the New York Stock Exchange, his net worth went up 10%. Oh. <laughs> so he said, oh, this is going to happen with that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> that might be what Facebook and uh, Amazon end up seeing if they end up getting broken up. You never know. But uh, we have to credit Rockefeller as much as he's been vilified, but he deserves full recognition for creating the modern oil industry. And the foundation for that is essential for how efficient it is. It's a highly efficient industry and uh, can deliver low-cost uh, energy throughout the entire world as being the main reason for our society's prosperity in the last century. Absolutely. Um, it's a very, very efficient source of energy, right? It definitely is. And it's still growing. I mean, as I showed you in one of those charts, uh, since I got in the oil business, uh, Production has grown from uh, mid-55, 60 million barrels a day to 80, 85 million barrels a day today. So it's, uh, it's not declining, it's actually expanding. So that leads us to where we're currently at today, where we have our current level of supply in the market. But for some reason, the demand side can't absorb the supply. And that's how there was, for a short period of time, uh, zero dollar gas or sorry oil um, do you want to tell our audience how that occurred and um, was it part of was speculation part of this um, fluctuation in the oil price well speculation always factors in to oil commodity pricing 
because people do make a living out of buying and selling futures. Uh, the problem for those traders is that when the end of their contract comes up and there's no room to store their oil, they don't want to take possession of those liquid barrels because they have no place to put them. Your office could only hold a few barrels, so <laughs> I don't think you want that obligation. So that's why we saw some negative pricing, is that speculators were unloading their positions so they wouldn't have to take physical possession of the oil, and there was just no room for it. The, the, the traditional uh, storage tank uh, capacity at Cushing and other places uh, just couldn't handle it. So it was being given away. In fact, people were paying to have it taken away. So in commodities, speculation is a whole industry. People make their living on that. Can you talk about how speculation impacts the oil industry? Well, it's always been part of it ever since we've had uh, markets like NYMEX, New York Mercantile Exchange. It's been trading oil for decades. So you can buy futures contracts and options speculate that way. It's just like any other commodity. Uh, where it gets uh, overblown is what happened uh, in around 2007-2008 when uh, sovereign wealth funds and other major funds were speculating with oil as a reserve against inflation. Uh, they thought having liquid assets like oil would be a good long-term investment. And so they all did that. And the combined effect was to drive oil prices uh, up to record highs that are still never, hasn't have been met since then. And then someone uh, in that herd figured out that this isn't sustainable and they wanted to unload their position. And once one herd member did that, did that, everyone did that. And so we had a collapse in prices down to some of the lowest levels we've seen until recently. So that happened in a very short period of time, in a matter of months. Then the market took uh, went back to its normal trading patterns after that. But it can disrupt the market if it's done massively by too much, uh, too many speculators. That's an interesting way to think about it. When there's too many, currently, do you think that there are too many speculators and not uh, you know, enough people actually in the market for the commodity? That's a good question. Uh, I think. The recent experience in the last couple of weeks has uh, revealed that Chinese speculators have lost their shirt, <laughs> um, thinking that oil prices have bottomed out. They didn't. Um, and then there's the disastrous meeting of OPEC and Russia and other OPEC Plus members uh, back in March, where Russia refused to budge, and the um, their parent to Saudi Arabia, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, um, decided to go on a rampage and do a price war. Now, if one would want to be a bit cynical, uh, you could think that Putin had deliberately orchestrated that so that he and his cronies could make a whole bunch of money in futures. Because <laughs> the price dropped from 30 in the 30s down to, uh, well, actually in the 50s down to uh, the 20s. In, a few trades uh, could have made billions of dollars for people who had advanced knowledge of that event. So you can speculate that may have happened. It wouldn't surprise me because uh, Putin, as much as you disagree with his policies, has demonstrated to be a very strategic thinker and anticipates most movements like this. He doesn't need to react. So for those who are skeptical, uh, skeptical about this, um, how would that hedge work? Well, if you're Putin and his cronies, and you knew you were going to set up the uh, man-child that runs Saudi Arabia, uh, you would just do what he did. And you'd uh, acquire all kinds of options for, uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the short side. So you buy options to sell oil at $50 a barrel uh, for as long as you can, as many as you can, without causing too much suspicion. And then uh, do what they did, and then have oil trade at 25 or 30 and you sell those options and you make 10 or $20 a barrel. So if, if you had, uh, literally we sell 35 billion barrels a year, even if you had a billion or 2 billion barrels option, just for a short period of time, you could have made 20 or $30 billion in that trade. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That really makes the conspiracy theorists sound somewhat uh, rational when you put it like that. Well, when there's money involved, then anything's possible. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, Jeff, uh, prior to this uh, conversation, you sent over some charts. Uh, some of them showed U.S. plus Canada with the opposing uh, line being Russia plus Saudi. Can you go over those? Yeah, I think we should discuss those four countries because those are the four top producers in the world. And uh, they've been naturally connected. Like Canada, the United States is one block. We, we go in lockstep. Uh, Canada, the United States, on energy policy, foreign policy, uh, we fight in each other's wars. I mean, we, we, we're strong allies, so Canada, U.S. is really one block. And uh, also, most of the shale production from horizontal drilling is com comes from Canada, the United States. So, 9 million, million barrels a day added to the market from shale is almost all from Canada, the United States. So that's one block. And then the other block that's uh, an obvious combination because they've been working together is Saudi Arabia and Russia. And uh, it's shown when Saudi Arabia did their second price war back in 2014, uh, Russia intervened and, and negotiated the, the OPEC plus deal with Saudi as the main partner in that negotiation. So Russia and Saudi is, are linked like Siamese twins and Canada United States are are one block. So those two blocks are really the two main competing forces in the crude oil market. The U.S.-Canada connection makes a lot of sense. I mean, geographically, uh, socially, I mean, our economy is very similar. But the Russia-Saudi thing is uh, a little bit less uh, obvious to me. How did that relationship um, bud? I think it evolved a necessity. Uh, back in 2014, when the price crash happened because of Saudi uh, actions or inaction, really, they decided not to cut back production, just let the market collapse. And their stated intention was to uh, destroy the U.S. and the Canadian shale industries. So the U.S. Canada block was the target. Um, Russia intervened because their revenues were dropping to a level where they, they were uncomfortable. On, on social programs inside their own country, they, they uh, wanted to make sure they could stabilize their country, so they had a need to work with Saudi Arabia. Um, the, other, uh, uh, the other reason is Iran. I mean, Iran and Saudi Arabia are at loggerheads, and Russia is an ally of Iran, and they have a reasonable relationship with Saudi Arabia, and they're the only honest broker that could deal with both countries. Because Iran uh, was having its problems with Saudi Arabia, and they couldn't agree on oil policy, but Russia was able to broker that relationship. So Russia is now a um, strategic partner to OPEC, especially uh, Iran and, Ar and Saudi Arabia. Interesting how that all works, right? Because yeah. that is correct. Russia does have domestic relationships with both of those countries. So it probably makes Russia punch above their weight. Uh, internationally because of that relationship. Definitely. Uh, and they're a strategic competitor to the Americans, so it's a natural uh, relationship for them to ally with America's allies to try to you know, divide and conquer. Putin's always thinking. <laughs> He's a chess player. Uh, unfortunately, some of the world leaders are chess pl are checker players, not chess players like he is. <laughs> <laughs> Someone way smarter than me said that history is bound to repeat itself. So looking at the historical movement of the oil industry, where do you th see things going in the future? Well, let's look at what drove the industry so far. Uh, and it's not really ha has ever really been a free market. There's always been competing blocks and influences on the production side that tried to create uh, at least an oligopoly uh, to manage the market. And that worked. Sometimes doesn't work other times. But it did work up until 1973 when the Seven Sisters collaborated to manage the market. So they kept prices low at the field, at the wellhead, and they made their money in downstream refining and marketing. And the Seven Sisters uh, were BP, Shell, uh, Exxon, Mobil, Texaco, Chevron, and Amoco. And those last five are actually descendants of um, 
some of the Rockefeller Standard Oil companies. But uh, then uh, there was a fateful meeting between uh, the Seven Sisters and OPEC, which up until 1973 was rather a reserved, conservative, a non-controversial group that uh, didn't really care much its weight. And, and they uh, basically told the Seven Sisters, we need to renegotiate our oil contracts. We don't like the low price we're getting in the field, because that's where Saudi Arabia and others like, like them and fire OPEC got their revenue. Uh, the Seven Sisters basically said, a deal's a deal's a deal, so it's off. <laughs> and, and OPEC took note of that and uh, decided that, well, we're not going to have this off. We're actually going to take some action. There was the Yom Kippur War, uh, which uh, was basically an OPEC country alliance against Israel. And then shortly after that, uh, there was the Arab oil embargo, uh, which uh, clearly showed the vulnerability of the West to the oil supply chain. And uh, from that point on, OPEC controlled the market until, uh, until the mid-80s. Uh, the Iranian Revolution happened in between, and uh, pricing uh, increased again uh, to heights that OPEC could only dream of before. Uh, Saudi Arabia was trying to manage that price by being the swing producer, so they kept cutting back uh, until they reached a point in 1985 where they dropped their production from something like 10 million barrels to 2.7 million barrels a day. And they said, enough's enough, we don't want to do this anymore. So that was their first price war. They flooded the market in December 1985, and in 86, the price collapsed. And uh, it even got to levels that were similar to today uh, in real terms. And that price war didn't work because the industry didn't go out of business. Um, and they realized in Saudi Arabia that that was a futile effort. And so they eventually went back uh, to uh, normal production levels and, and trying to uh, stabilize the price, which it did. Uh, but over the next uh, couple decades, it was choppy. It was difficult to manage the market so they could have a stable price. Uh, and then you had things like uh, the Asian economic flu that destroyed demand. Uh, just at the time that OPEC thought it was safe to increase output, and then that was a price collapse. The dot-com bubble burst. That was a recession caused demand destruction. Uh, we had a couple of wars in the Middle East and the Gulf uh, that caused prices to spike. So it was a choppy period, and OPEC was trying to keep the price in the $40 barrel range in today's dollars. Um, and then the peak oil experience happened. And peak oil is a theory that was brought forward by a, a geophysicist in the 1950s called King Hubbard. And he accurately predicted using the statistical analysis technique that U.S. oil production would peak in the mid, mid to early 70s, and he was right, it did. And it was starting to decline significantly, and using that formula, the world was supposed to be having peak oil by 2005, and so pricing started to really climb. And that's when the uh, bubble speculators got involved drove prices even higher until that bubble burst. And then the shale revolution happened. Uh, this is not predicted by Hubbard's uh, peak oil calculation because it's a new technology. It radically changed the oil industry. Uh, shale is an almost impermeable rock that has oil in it, but it can't really move very well. And no one ever thought you could produce oil from shale until someone in Texas uh, had this crazy idea to do a horizontal drilling and then fracture it. <laughs> uh, even his name is, I think he was George Mitchell, and his board even was against the idea, but he owned the majority of the company, so he over, overruled his board. And he <laughs> yeah. experimented with this horizontal multi-stage fracking, and it worked. <laughs> and it totally revolutionized natural gas and crude oil. And you look at uh, the world oil reserves of 2.2 trillion barrels, currently, is probably a similar amount of shale reserves. Wow. And there are, you know, Canada, United States have the producing shale regions, but there are at least 19 other equally sized basins around the world. 
uh, and what keeps uh, the OPEC members up at night is price being so high that all these shell basins decide to invest in drilling and they flood the market. Because of the 80 some odd million barrels a day of production today, we could easily add 50 million barrels a day from new shale deposits. Uh, that is a game changer for the oil market. We no longer have this peak oil fear that supply is going to be limited. Technology is radicalized the future for where crude oil is going to go. Interesting. Now I could add to where I think the future is going. Uh, first of all, the short term. Let's talk about that. <clears throat> the COVID pandemic and the isolation reduced demand dramatically. So uh, demand is down by about 10 million barrels a day from where it was uh, before the pandemic. It might even be larger than that uh, in the 15 million barrel a day range. So demand dropped from 83 to uh, you know, 65 million barrels a day. OPEC plus uh, eventually got an agreement broken by Russia and the United States um, to reduce their production by 10 million barrels a day, but that's not enough. So there's more production than demand. And when that happens, it's only a matter of time before storage gets full. When storage gets full to the, you know, the brim, then oil goes into a, a free fall. Uh, oil is it's very inelastic in terms of pricing. Economists talk about inelastic demand, inelastic supply. Um, it's true for oil. Um, you only need a small change in production and demand to have dramatic change in price. So with the Saudi uh, price war number three and demand destruction from the COVID pandemic, it was the perfect storm to have a total collapse in oil prices. And it's magnified by reaching full storage. That eventually will clear itself out because Higher cost producers are going to have to shut in because they're negative cash flow right now. Uh, and so production will level out. And uh, shale is very short life production. It declines very quickly. Uh, and if there's no new investment in shale, that 9 million barrels a day will rapidly drop to 5 million, 4 million in the next year. And eventually the supply will sort itself out with demand. Uh, long term, cheap oil means demand will eventually increase again. And we may get back up to our 83 million barrel a day uh, consumption. Uh, pricing, I think, <clears throat> is unlikely to get back to that 50 to 60 dollar range in the next uh, five years. And the reason why I say that is that there's so much pent up production capacity from non shale sources that uh, it could ill take care of any um, uh, demand growth and also. It can make money below $50 a barrel, which is the minimum price shale needs to be economic. So, you know, when you look back in history, $40 a barrel in today's dollars was a reasonable price for oil for many decades. People uh, can make money at that price level. Shale is a lot more expensive. Uh, oil sands is also expensive, and you'll see less investment there too. So, with a dramatic drop in investment in uh, competing supply, Canada and the United States, then the uh, Saudi-Russia bloc will take more market share because they're lower cost. So uh, long term, and I'm talking five to ten years, uh, we will be about $50 a barrel or less. Uh, and there might be the odd war uh, that spikes it up briefly, but we're unlikely to see the $70 barrel pricing we had before uh, the pandemic, and certainly we're not going to see $100 barrel oil. Yeah. <laughs> so this might be an obvious question, but seeing that most of the U.S. Canada reserves are at a higher production cost, does that mean that there's going to be a big change in the U.S. production rates? Yes. Uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, the sunk costs for current oil sands uh, are done. I mean, you don't have to work. Investors have written those off. So as long as there's an operating margin, and at $40 a well, U.S., uh, oil sands can make an operating margin, so they'll, the existing production will continue. Uh, shale, same thing, that most of the existing production is being hedged, 
uh, for a year, which is their, where most most of the payout happens. But new investment in shale is drought, already dry, dried up, and it's unlikely we'll see massive new investment in shale in the next uh, few years because they, they can't afford this volatility. This is too risky for them, and the costs are too high. So shale will be curtailed investment. It'll, that production will drop. Uh, oil sands will flatten out. Uh, there'll be very few new projects, if any. Um, so eventually, uh, Canada U.S. oil production will drop down from its current levels. And I predict uh, at least a 5 million barrel a day drop in the next year, and uh, possibly more. Because uh, if we have sub-$30 price, then even conventional oil is challenged, and you'll see shut-ins because the operating margins don't exist at that price level. So the future is... Uh, Downward production from North America, stable production from Saudi Arabia, Russia, and uh, it's not going to be a very rosy price picture for the oil industry. But there will be winners and losers. Those who are the low cost producers will be the winners, high cost producers will be the losers. Hmm. Well, seeing that you made those predictions, it makes a lot of sense that you're doing what you're doing now. Jeff, do you want to talk about some of the new technologies that you're working on and how that can dramatically impact the way we deal with energy? There's um, a growing niche in the petroleum business, what we call biofuels uh, or alternative energy. And it's basically, how do you make gasoline, diesel fuels, jet fuel, from non-fossil fuel materials? And uh, ethanol, for example, is largely produced from corn in the United States and uh, wheat in Canada. Biodiesel is largely made from canola oil and soy oil, as well as animal fat. And uh, those are alternative materials to create uh, hydrocarbon fuels. And the uh, problem with those uh, food for fuel technologies, which have been around a long time, several decades, is that the uh, food inputs sometimes have a much different price uh, cycle than, than your output uh, does. The um, uh, problem with food versus fuel also is that you're competing uses for, for these food crops. Uh, and that's been the big problem for first generation biofuels, which uses food inputs. Uh, second generation biofuels uses waste biomass, uh, materials that have no other use, and definitely not food, and uh, do not compete with the food market. In our case, our technology can use uh, wood residue from uh, sawmills or logging, like uh, forest slash piles from after the logging has been done. You can also use the organic part of municipal solid waste. Uh, we can use uh, plant residue from agricultural sector. Uh, for example, uh, hemp processing leaves a lot of residue. We can use all that. Um, we can even use uh, methane produced from fermenting uh, animal manure. So uh, having those waste inputs available gives us a big advantage because those are very low cost and they're predictable. We can negotiate a contract that uh, locks in the feedstock price. Uh, you can't do that uh, for crude oil. <laughs> I mean, you can. There's a futures curve. Uh, but uh, we have a low input cost. So having very low cost inputs gives us a huge advantage in producing gasoline. Uh, and in our case, uh, if we're looking at uh, crude oil prices as the benchmark for where we sell our gasoline, uh, we can still make a reasonable rate of return if uh, West Texas Intermediate is in the 25 to $33 a barrel range. Uh, and that puts us among the low-cost producers of, of any of these fossil fuel, conventional fossil fuel producers. If you look at the futures curve, which is the market uh, bet on what they think the futures price is, and it's a good bet because if, you, if I wanted to lock in a price for when I start up my uh, biorefinery, I can do that. Uh, right now, I can lock in uh, in the mid-30s um, dollars WTI per barrel. Uh, for when I start up in 2023, uh, and then it grows to the mid-40s uh, in the following eight years. 
So you, know, you can lock in these prices and guarantee a margin. And uh, my potential investors like that. Uh, so being a low cost producer, using an alternative feedstock is just a good idea, irrespective of you know, the greenhouse gas credits that come with that. I'm, I'd rather have something economic without any GHG support, because then I know I don't have to depend on government regulations and the whims of future governments and their budgets. Uh, we'll make a lot more money from the GHG credits than we will from the gasoline. We can almost give away our gasoline and still make money. But I, I don't want to promise that because that's not my control. The costs are in our control, and I can show a good margin in today's price environment. And what was the company name again? Oh, my company is um, inspired by the Rainforest Collective in Alberta, which is a group of 2,000 professionals that want to create an ecosystem of innovation. So our company is called Rainforest Energy Corp. Our website is www.rainforestenergy.ca. So, Jeff, I'm assuming you've gotten some really great feedback from the market. I mean, something like what you're working on could be very disruptive. Yes, it is. Uh, the uh, biofuel market, though, has been crowded with a lot of train wrecks. Uh, there are many ethanol plants that are being shut down now, and this is the first time that's happened to them, where corn prices and ethanol prices went in opposite directions. And so the ethanol business, by its, as a standalone business, has a bad rap, and that's hurt us because we're also biofuels. But what's helped us is showing why we're different, why our approach makes a lot of sense and can uh, have a stable return. And from the investors I've talked to and the governments I've spoken to, they're quite excited about this. Uh, it, it just takes time to disrupt a market and it doesn't happen overnight. Absolutely. you got to educate your stakeholders when you're bringing in a new product and a new disruptive product at that. So for the people who are watching this, if they want to get in contact with you or be involved with your technology, how can they do that? Well, first, I recommend check out our website. We have a corporate presentation that describes in considerable detail what we do and where our projects are. We have far more projects than we can handle. Uh, so what I'm looking for is partners. Um, if you have a project that, and you've got some capital that you can invest in it, then contact me and we can talk about how we can work together. So you already have some projects going on in Canada and in the U.S., correct? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, one in Alberta, actually two, but uh, one that's progressed uh, to the state where we're able to be shovel ready, what I call shovel ready, uh, and that's in partnership with a rural community that uh, wants to attract uh, a number of agricultural ventures to connect with us because we produce gasoline, but we also have several valuable co-products. We produce surplus power. We have uh, clean water. It's a byproduct. We have residual heat. And we also produce greenhouse grade carbon dioxide, which greenhouses love to use to enhance their yield. So there are four or five uh, ag ventures that want to connect to us in this rural community to use those co-products. It gives them a huge advantage in their markets. And then uh, we have a project in Maine with a community that's dependent on the forestry industry. We had a pulp and paper mill shut down 10 years ago. And uh, our, again, <clears throat> we can use wood residue from the logging industry, which is very large in Maine. Uh, and the uh, byproducts we produce are going to support several co-ventures inside that community to diversify their economy and create what I consider a community circular economy, which is really the way of the future to try to have interdependent businesses that uh, at the end of, of the process have no waste. If we totally repurpose waste so that we don't have any waste, then that's the secret for the future, the future circular economy. Well, I've got to commend you on your work. You've done some great things uh, in the philanthropic area for both the environment and humanity. So you are a gentleman and a scholar, Mr. Arsenich. Thank you very much for your time today. And Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Salabatian. <laughs> I hope this was enlightening. Until I see you again, stay savvy.